right, uh, let's get started. Um, both of this session on on UX, UX and the fire. Uh, can anyone hear? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So the other room, I was in the microphone. It's really bad. So just checking. Um, right. So if it waits for last stragglers here to show up. All right. Um, so. <clears throat> All right, a um, bit about me before we start. So the topic here is UX and the fire. It's essentially a lot of the criticism that UX comes under due to a lot of misconceptions that exist throughout UX. So my name is Jacob. Um, you may know me as one of the people behind Node One. I was one of its founders. Nowadays, I'm actually working. Uh, I'm actually um, on my own again, and I'm building a company called Sweet, which is a distributed digital agency. And here are my contact details. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a strategic digital agency, a distributed, uh, distributed agency, and we do things differently from other companies, uh, and it's, uh, it's something I should work on right now. Uh, all right, so you can check out the website in case you're interested. Um, so you get a lot of bad rap from a lot of people because they don't understand it, and uh, there are a lot of myths. So, I think it's time to bust it. And one of the things I've often heard about UX is that it's, it's just a high candy. Uh, like this kind of the dialogue. Like, oh, look what our engineer made. Can you please slip in color and make it pretty? Yeah. Right? Uh, I even have a friend that was called in to a project like this and he declined. You know, they were like, yeah, we're working this, this looks so good, you know, so we just make, we're to make it presentable to our CEO. It's like, no, that's not the way you should do it. Uh, so, to understand why this is a problem, why, why this is wrong, let's go back to the roots of why UX was invented in the first place. Um, so I'm going to take some really some famous examples for UX. So in Europe, we have an airline called Ryanair. Maybe you heard of it. And Ryanair, they have tried to, they, they're basically a bad copy of Southwest. So they essentially they're cheap, but they they they're not good in any way, uh, including their their usability. I don't fly Ryanair. As a, uh, on principle, but that's mostly because they treat their cabin crew, you know, badly, and I think that's a recipe for disaster. But something to do is, when you are, when you, when you actually buy a ticket to the website, you have the option of choosing uh, insurance. Uh, and there's no option that says, I don't want, I don't want any insurance. Instead, you have hit it in the list of countries you can live in. Uh, so there, don't cover me. It's a country apparently. It's a new member of the European Union. Yep, according to Ryanair. Uh, here's a, an elevator somewhere in uh, Mexico or Spain. And those of you who speak Spanish understand why this is very confusing. Uh, this is a very much a real world example, but still, I would I, I would have any idea you know, what, which button to, to push if I was in this elevator. Uh, and then it's, uh, I don't know how the other subway menus look here, but this would look like in Sweden. And First time I saw this menu, I'm like, "What? Like, do they have a menu with just uh, with just a sub and one with the one with the soda and one with the chips?" No, you, you're supposed to read them like you're supposed to read them like um, this is what's good everyone, and then just read these parts. But those of you that know like Gestalt psychology, you know the things that are lined up and grouped are seen as belonging together. So I read them like quite a bit. That's what your brain sees. Uh, and here's a really famous example from XKCD. Um, the Venn diagram of uh, what people look for at a university website and the information that usually is there. Uh, like I said, full name of school, check. Uh, but in e-commerce, poor usability is not just a nuisance. It's it's it, it's actually it means loss of revenue. Uh, and like uh, Jacob Nielsen once said, like increase sales by 100 percent by fixing usability. Small fixes on an e-commerce site. So if your customers are vendors, online vendors, running e-commerce sites, then they 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 have a lot of good reasons to actually to, to, to pay you to do some UX work for them. Um, so, do you think these are problems that can be resolved just by slapping some color on it? No, of course not. I mean, no. So what is UX? Then? If it's not about slapping color, it's, it's not one thing. Um, for me. UX is a, is a number of practices and methods. So in UX, you are to understand, to understand the user needs, 
uh, translate the needs into requirements, um, design indirect solutions, and evaluate those solutions iteratively. Um, and I would like to see it as an umbrella expression. So in user experience, we have a number of activities. We have information design, usability engineering, interaction design, information architecture, experience design, and web design, which we associated with these phones here. You know? so they, will, they will come back later in the presentation. Right, so this is how I see uh, what, what UX is about. So let, let's ask Google, you know, like, what do other people think? Let's Google. Uh, apparently this guy, Patrick Mar Marseille.com, UX include HTML, XML, slash JSON. So what are you doing? We do Ajax now. I want to race. <laughs> According to the Japanese information architects, which I would honestly doubt their information architecture proficiency with all this stuff like yeah it's pretty but you know it doesn't make me any wiser uh, and apparently at this company you also did with customer service so if you're looking for a job somewhere ask them to draw the kind of Venn diagram of the UX specialty and what it involves uh, and at this company you're not the only one doing human computer interaction there's someone else having a say too. Um, and chances are, this is what looks like your office. <clears throat> so there, there's clearly a lot of confusion here. So let's let's define this. So these things here, they are the activities. These are the things we do. Uh, these are the these are these are sets of tools that we do carry out in our work. And then there's the qualities that we that we achieve that we produce in the products. So how do these things relate? Well, at the core, we have the usability goals. Things like efficiency, you know, ease to learn, have good utility. And those, in turn, lead to product having the other things, like being supportive of creativity, entertaining and helpful and motivating. Um, so, the one great user experience requires good usability. So it's easy to, re easy to remember how to use, which means it's probably motivating and satisfying too at the same time. Can you think of a product that is not easy to use, but still motivating? Well, some are. Games are hard. We play them because they're hard. But they're hard in the right way. If, if you struggle with user interface for your, for your, for your game and watch, you will use it. No, you want to be beaten by the, by the gorilla, like throwing, you know, like logs at you, not by the button, you know, like doing what you think it should. So we have all these tools. And they allow us to create, create good usability and great use experiences. So here comes that we also implement solutions to solve this problem. We also we do the actual design work. We actually we build prototypes and we, we do user interfaces and so on. <clears throat> uh, but you know, like show this show right away. What, what does it matter? You know, like it's, it's going to work anyway. Well, UX doesn't concern how something looks. It concerns how it works. And that's why in Sweden they have the expression. For the evening, which means a given form or shape to something. And people use it interchangeably for design. What I like about design is that you design a solution. You just don't give something an appearance or something. You actually you design how it works. And uh, some companies have made the insight, this insight, and this is critical that you can get enormous business value out of making sure something works in a pleasing way. Um, and one way to illustrate this is to look at this uh, pyramid here. So, ranging from tasks to experiences, you can look at different solutions. They go from functional to meaningful. So let's let's map some some products here to see how they. This is just my subjective understanding of things. Uh, but this here is where you start. And some companies actually pass by this line here, the, the chasm here. And some actually build meaningful things that are meaningful and just pleasurable to use. Things you use just because they're fun to use them. Like you can imagine the flicking, the flicking emotion on your phone when you like you flick that list on your iPhone or Android, and it keeps this momentum, you know, so it keeps rolling, you know. Or the way that the icons roll over the screen, that in fact it's entirely flawless. There's no, there's there, there's no slowness or anything. And I remember I said this to a friend. He had an Android phone, uh, phone an early generation. And I said, look how they look, look at stuttering, you know, when you're like scrolling the screen. Look at my iPhone; it goes smoothly. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's just it. That is a design thing, it doesn't matter. But it does indeed. Because the way you perceive something to work is how you think it works. So if it seems to work well, you believe it works well, and you can trust it more. So look at some companies here. 
uh, Adobe, for example, I don't very much trust them. I would say they, they end up somewhere here between useful and reliable products. Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu's products are actually getting better and better. The latest version of Ubuntu is actually on, actually across the chasm, I'd say. Uh, Microsoft, even better. Not really great, but uh, they're really spending a lot of time doing UI. Uh, Google, I like Google. Google, they, they are, I mean, it look as fancy as some, some stuff, but it works. And of course, Apple. But that's the brand they made design, pleasurable, meaningful, useful, wonderful design to be the brand. Uh, so let's just apply these tools we have. Whereas, well, so they took an example, Google Analytics. Um, so when they, when they built this product, they applied a lot of these tools in a way. Um, so let's look at which of the tools actually have an impact on design. So information design is a skill and practice of preparing information people understand, like graphs and diagrams. So the clear example here is, of course, the, the diagram of all the traffic to the site. Experience design is, is how it feels, like, like what kind of emotions do you give the rights to the user in the, in the usage. And it also has to do with using colors and, and things that engage the user. Information architecture, it's about how you structure information, how you tag content, taxonomies, navigation, menus. Use built engineering has to be the small details. Um, and use, use, uh, use built engineering is often about what we call user research, when you actually remove something like pixel or you, you change the word or something and you look at what the impact has on user experience. Interaction design, uh, it has to do with the behavior. They probably tried a lot of different versions of this, a drop down or tabs before they decided to go with exactly that kind of solution. And graphic design, the overall look and feel, the, 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 the gradient here and the colors and so on. But there are many that still, despite all these tools, don't make it. 82% of IT products are by their buyers considered unsuccessful. So let's break those down and have a look at what the, I mean, what, where, where it is that way. So 33% of the products are, are canceled for completion. Because they've gone so utterly wrong that they, yeah, they don't, they give up trying to finish them. Um, uh, Twenty-five percent of delivered on time budget, but the results are not what's expected. I'm going to argue that results is not a matter of whether the project is exactly to scope or requirements, but whether it actually delivers the business value. I'm going to do that in a bit. Uh, and twenty-five percent exceeded the budget. But they got everything they wanted. And the reasons for this, well, there are many. Very often, lack of user input involvement. You build something that actually didn't solve people's problem in a way that, that helped them. Um, requirements being incomplete. The requirements being clarified later on in, in the course of the project. Uh, unrealistic expectations. The customer, you know, like a customer having an idea what they were buying but was not what, what you were able to deliver. So, this is a massive waste. I mean, but we can fix this. You know, we have the tools. You know, we have the tools to identify different needs and design for them. But we also need to have the tools to understand. And I'm going to show this tool. And this tool is called effect mapping. Effect mapping relies on two different assumptions. The first was that every site website is built for a reason and to meet a goal. There are certain business values related to building this website or, or, or system. And the goals can only be achieved if people are using the websites. If it's not being used, it's, um, you know, there's, there's no effort coming out of it. Um, it has the advantage of, um, of providing a map, a very much a, a, a helicopter view of, of the different of the goals and of the stakeholders involved. It's called an effect map. It looks like this. So we're going to break down the map now and see where it, uh, it, it consists in parts. Uh, but at the core here is the actual effect. And finding that effect is the first thing you need to do. And it can be kind of hard because it needs to be a lot of thinking. You need the customer to think differently about IT products that you should do. And I call this the walk of why. So the customer comes to you and say, hey, we need a better website. And we're like, okay. Uh, but why? Well, it's really hard to find out who we are. And there's no way to post comments and feel involved. We're like, posting comments, okay, but why do you need that? Well, a big share of our customers want to feel involved, okay? Uh, well, 
we need to reach those customers in order to challenge more sales to our site. Aha, uh -huh. that's what they actually hoping to achieve. They want to challenge more, channel more sales to their site. That was something they told us. They want a better website. But what better meant? That's what you find out actually by asking why, why, why repeatedly. Um, I'm not recommending you to ask why, why, why. I'm, to, I'm asking you to involve in a more meaningful dialogue with your customer. But the core is to understand the motivation and the person holding the money, why they're actually giving you that money to build this site. So, okay. So we know what, what do we have to do to reach those customers in order to charge more sales to our site? Well, we're going to write that as an effect. An effect needs to be concise, should be more than a few sentences. Um, it needs to be measurable and it should be long term. So it, this is not something that happen overnight, it's going to happen over months or even longer. All right, so we formulate the effect and then we write a number of uh, ways to measure it. And as you can see, these are all highly quantified. It's not opinion. It's essentially, if you see this effect in your patterns, in your Google Analytics account, then we have succeeded. Um, and there's also a, a, light, a limiter. And that allows you to basically look back up six months and see what's working, what's not. Let's revise, let's improve, let's change. And here it goes, in the blue box. And right to the left of it, you have the goals specified. All right. So we have the effect, we have the goals. We need to understand who the users are. Okay, these are the ones, if they're not using the website, just not going to get an effect out of it. So you need to understand what motivates them and what do they expect from your site. So first of all, who are they? Well, to find out who they are, you can use the engineering. engineering. Um, a good way to start is to do observation and interviews to establish personas. Uh, are you familiar with personas? <coughs> Can you use some hands? Okay, good. So, all right, you're gonna, you're gonna deal with personas, okay. So personas are, personas are really good, not just for you, but for designers and for developers too, because they can actually relate to what it says in their persona. They, they're not designing for nobody, they're actually designing for a person. You can give the person a name, you can call him James, you can say he's 28 years old, you can say he works as an accountant, for example. You know that, you know, in, in spare time he likes watch, watching sports, drinking beer with his friends, okay, kind of stereotypical, but still like, he's like, would James really like this? Would he actually think this button was sort of like, would that help him, you know? And you can start involving in dialogue with that person. I would even recommend you to print out these personas and tape them to the walls in your office. And that allows us to answer these questions. What goals do they have? What tasks do they need to carry out? And what are, who are these users? Uh, and then we can map them out here. Now I've done a very sort of, I would not generally not recommend you to divide people into these roles because these roles are often not about where they work in a company, but what kind of behavior they have. What's say like information seekers, information retrie retrievers, information publishers, the curious ones, and so on. Try to think more about what kind of behavior, how they are as people, more than where they happen to work. Um, so the next step here is to figure out how they co how they conceptualize the information they need, like. How will they be finding information? And here's where information architecture comes in place. And using card sorting and, and tree testing, you can actually, you can see, you can find the most logical way to divide your content, the way to present it, you know, in terms of menus, and doing interviews and site maps and so on. And that in turn lets us answer even more questions about this user. Okay, so we know a bit about who they are and what kind of information they're looking for and how they expected information to be divided and organized. So next thing we need to know is what are the goals? Like why do they why do they need this information? And here's where experience design experience design interaction design and graphic design come in. We can do wireframes, we can do style how to catch a feel in the visual structure of the site. We can do mock-ups, storyboards and journey maps. Build scenarios. Are you familiar with journey maps? <coughs> So something that's really exciting recently is um, uh, is um, a, 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 form of, a, a discipline of design called um, service design. So regularly in the business, you're thinking channels. Someone does the print channel, someone does the web channel. But in service design, you, you, you go above that and you look at the customer's experience through all these different channels. 
the design, regardless of channel, find solutions which are suiting best. And one way to visualize the way a customer would interface with their company would be to provide a so called journey map. All right. So how do we how do we measure these uh, these goals? Well, we define the goals that the, that the users have, and then we put up uh, a way to measure them. Because so we deal with the overall effect. But now we can look at each target group, what they expect, and how well we meet that expectation or serve that need. And this is the this is the most these are the, this, these are things that really matter when it comes down to your site. Now we have now what you have now is that you have to find what the customer expects. You have to find who they need to engage and what they are expected from the website. It's just one more component now in order to actually have a full, complete, basically, they basically have the foundation for a project, you know, for, for the requirements list. And that is the actually tasks. That's the next step. So, like you see, it, now we put the goals out here and we also made them measurable. We have also translated them into tasks. So, in order to want to reduce, want to so, for example, this user here wants to replace paper forms with online forms. In order to do that, uh, he needs to be able to create forms for common application requests, make it possible for, you, for users to digitally sign forms. So you know what functions he's expecting. Now you can design the user interface, the mockups, and everything to serve that need, given his personas, given this person's expectations. So, as you can see, using user using research, user research and design we can actually convert business, we can actually create business value and, and make requirements that help deliver that business value. This is not at all about slapping color on something. It's actually about making sure what we're building actually serves its purpose. Without this work, we're shooting blind. So, how can we help people understand this? That, that this is actually what UX is about. That, that Criticism of UX is, 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 is misplaced. It's about not understanding what UX is about. The, the pivotal role that UX has in modern technology. I, I, I dare say that many of the failures of IT projects can be avoided. And I think we have to do this. I mean, we can't actually get away from, from, from the consistent failure of actually building solutions that meet people's needs without actually thinking this way. The resistance to UX as a practice is a resistance to, to working web or IT solutions generally, and companies are hiring people. Uh, companies are hiring more and more UX people. It's it's evident. Even the big ones that deliver all the all the systems that uh, big corporations use in order to do uh, all the internal stuff they do, and from accounting to all the modeling, all the costs, everything, can understand that like poor usability is really stopping them from getting the results they expect. So it's it's better money. It's it's basically it's, you're a bad business person if you're not using UX. Well, one way to do this also is to use something called the UX value proposition. And this is a way to visualize the impact of some UX work. It's highly subjective though, so it's, 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 not, it's not objective in any way it means, but it gives you a visual idea of where you basically, where it's worthwhile to put your efforts. So it works such a way that you break down your, to break down your project into a number of goals. You wanna uh, you wanna migrate users from brick and mortar stores to online self service. This is a customer that has a brick and mortar store, store and wants you know convert to fill in the in, you know, e commerce site, reach more customers, and maybe eventually shut down the physical store. Then when we when we listed those, then we actually break them down into the UX attributes that influence them. So what influence will usability have, for example, on the on the on this goal, for example. What we then do is that we map them out in this in this list. This could be just a regular spreadsheet, and then we rate them. We rate the current state of it, and then we rate the potential state of it. So when it made this effort, what could the experience potentially be like? And this uh, this is a, this should be a conservative guess on your part. Like what could it potentially help them create? Uh, so gain potential, cost investment, essentially gain potential, cost investment. In the end, you have a sheet where you can very visually should see where here's where I can actually make an impact for you. So, so it's all good, right? But and I would say, oh yeah, that's not going to pay for you know. But do you know in a real case where this really made a difference? And yes, I do. So 
here comes the $300 million epoch. I mean, uh, yeah, that's the right amount of zero, yeah. Um, and this is actually something Jared Spool wrote for him. Um, this guy was actually a keynote speaker at the last Rupacon here in the US. I wasn't attending that one. His um, it's, it's, name is in my mind right now. Uh, but he's written a book, entire book about web forms. And he wants a story of how what bad web forms can really can really have an impact on the bottom line. So it, it's about an e-retailer, e and they have a jacket form. Looks like this. Uh, you can buy hodgepodge. Uh, you can say how much you want, and you can see the mantle and how oh, fine. All right, nothing fancy. Uh, the problem is they try to be smart, so they add this function. You have to register before you can check out. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great service. You know, like, wow, you can save so much time, you know. It's the biggie if you're going to use it. It just takes a few minutes. All right, good. They think. So Susie, she wants some hodgepodge. Uh, and she's shaking side and she's ordered some hodgepodge. And, but she's like, seriously, why do I have to fill this in? I don't know. I just want to buy some stuff. I don't want to have, and can get involved in a relationship with these guys. Uh, and she's like, Mm, I might have ordered it before, you know, let me, let me go back and check. In fact, she has ordered tons of times. She's a big fan of Harry Potter, so she has all these Harry Potter inspired email addresses. And the thing is, she has constantly forgotten her name and she has changed email address. So it has like, like four entries in the database. Eventually, she's like, never mind. It's not worth it. All right. But somehow, they actually find out. The, the, the people running this, they oh, right, this is a problem. So I'm like, maybe it wasn't so smart to put that registration form there anyway. Maybe it wasn't so smart to force people to register. So let's, um, let's try and remove it and see what happens. So they remove the register button and replace it with this. You can continue without, or you can log in. And uh, results were pretty massive. 45% increase in sales, in sales by that simple change. But that was not a change an engineer realized. That was not a change that, uh, that the designer saw. It was something that a usability profession analyzed the workflow and talked to users analyzed and saw. So there's, there's massive, uh, massive gains to be made from UX. And UX, uh, UX is important. So our takeaways, but UX isn't just eye candy or concern with appears. It deals with how something works. And UX links business goals to requirements in a way very few other disciplines can. Uh, it offers a toolbox of methods to help us do these translation business goals to requirements. And it's proven, and there are 300,000 cases. Why it does. Uh, so if you like this session, please evaluate it. I would appreciate your feedback, and thank you so much. All right, uh, sorry, any questions? Did I see any hands here? Um, yeah. Hi, uh, sorry. Um, so I work at uh, post-secondary in uh, Lethbridge, Alberta. And I'm curious how you would deal with um, people who have gathered data, but you have a set of your own, um, but there might be conflicts because some of it may be biased, especially people who have worked with the audience for quite some time, but they may not have noticed some of the trends that um, you've been gathering on your own which is an unfortunate uh, case of miscommunication. But so how, so I guess my question is, how would you deal with my data versus your data? And in, you know, if there was bias there, how would you, how would you deal with that? Okay, so, so the customer has been doing user research on their own. Yeah, mostly in the case of uh, recruitment, but I find they're not asking the why, it's more like, a, a therapy session, I guess, you know, well, I guess, sorry. The, I just find that they're not asking the whys behind some of um, the reasons for why people do things. 
they're just, it's more like a case of how do you feel, but they don't really explore that. Oh, uh, okay, all right. And, and, and you could handle this information as some kind of, something you could use as a, this sort of like a... Um, like usually a survey or if they're in a yeah, focus group. I see. Yeah. All right, and they hand it to you and like, yeah, look at this, can I help you make a better design, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, go, I would go back to those users and maybe not talk to all of them, but talk to some that are representative and try and, and have interviews with them. Uh, you usually need to speak to so many people. And, and the interesting thing is that if you read Steve Kirk's book, uh, I think it's, it's not the one, uh, don't make me think, it's not the one about usability testing. And it's like most of the usability mistakes, the biggest ones can be discovered by anyone. You don't need to have someone who's a perfect, you know, target group you can find. And it's, it's in the same in this case, you don't need to talk all of them, you need to talk to a few that you think are representative of the group. Uh, and that will help you vi validate your ideas regarding what they are. Actually, their motivations for feeling and thinking the way they do. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Any more questions? Hi, I was wondering, um, how do you handle feature creep in, a, in projects with when it comes to UX design? Um, if you have clients that, through the mock-up process or the wireframe process, keep adding things. You, wouldn't it be nice if our users could save their favorite something? Um, do you try and handle that in the mock-up phase and, and then say, no more features? It, uh, did you comment on that? Well, um, feature creep usually becomes a problem later on when trying to build a project and you have a fixed deadline and, and you actually initially had a fixed scope. I previously, just before this, I had a session with Shannon the test on the, the PM buff, which I, I recommend you guys to attend after this one. Uh, where well, we're going to discuss these things even more. Uh, so I think uh, feature creep is, is a, the biggest problem is during the implementation process. That's when it's, it's really scary. But even as a designer, when it comes to changing it, there's, yeah, you have to, design is holistic. Like it's, it's you can't design one thing in, in detail in, 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 I, in isolation. And even though it's good to try and achieve modular design, it's not always realistic. Um, I would try and, I would try to discuss things with customers relevant to the customer. Uh, basically, trying to get these things out when it is to change, like in the wireframe stage, and try and get all this feedback out in the wireframe stage, and and have them understand that if you change, make changes later, it's going to look good. It's gone and take time, uh, and try to have some meaningful dialogue, and and not just go from basically what they say to red mockup and try and increase the. You could actually go, you can actually go from a very rough wireframe. The ones you can make for the tool called uh, Mockingbird.com, or, or I think it's called Go Mockingbird. It's called. Uh, it's a, so it's an online mockup tool and makes very rough wireframes. And then you can take one of those and you can t maybe move it into into um, Illustrator and make it even fine the add fonts and the colors, so you can collect feedback, uh, you know, over several stages. And then maybe you can catch some of those requests much sooner when the change is much easier. Great. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? We have plenty of time, so. All right, well, if you have more questions, you can just um, you can ask me on Twitter, or you can uh, come look me up. Um, I'll, be, I'll be around here tomorrow, too, so um, thank you for attending. Thank you for very good questions, right?